All right, section 5.2 is sigma notation. What we were doing in the last section was we were adding up a whole bunch of rectangles, right? Okay. We have a symbol that takes care of all of that addition stuff for us, and it's an uppercase Greek letter sigma. That's this symbol right here. That's a capital sigma. Those of you who took stats are okay with this, right? <laughs> or Greek. A sub k is the formula we use for the kth term. This lower number here, k is what we're going to call our variable for the summation. k will either, it, it has a starting point. Down here we tell you the starting point. Okay? This is the starting point. N up here is the ending point. K is called the index. The index is kind of like our variable of a function. So in example one, I have a problem with the sigma here, and I want you to expand this with, without the sigma notation. Well, what sigma means is we're summing. Summing means adding. So we start out with k equals to 1 down here, and 90 times 1, because k is 1, divided by 1 plus 8. That's the first term. Plus, we go to the next term. We keep increasing k by integers, 1. So there's no fractions here. K, the index here on your summation has to be an integer. Well, the next term then would be 2. Well, guess what? That's also going to be the last term that we do. So this is going to be 90 times 2 divided by 2 plus 8. You see how all we're doing is we're replacing K with the next integer in line? Had that number on top of been 3, what would the next term have been? 90, 90 times 3 over 3 plus 8. Right. So this is summation symbols, and this is how you expand it. 90 times 1 is 90 divided by 9, and 90 times 2 is 180 divided by 10. So this sum is equal to, that's the value of that sum. All right. Can you go the other way? If I give you the sums here, can you use the sigma notation to rewrite this? Now, there's an infinite number of ways to represent this just by changing the lower limit. I'm telling you where to start this. So we're going to start this with the sum k equals 1, and we're going to go to what? And all I'm doing is I'm writing down the numbers, right? You see how you can take that sum and replace it with sigma notation. This becomes extremely important in Cal 2. We do a whole chapter on summations and series. So it's important in combinatorics? You use it in combinatorics some. It's a junior level course. I don't teach it. I took it. it seemed, it's a like, lot of counting. It seems like it would be. It's a lot of counting. All right, algebra rules for finite sums. Guess what? When you add two terms together in sigma, you can just add the sum summation of each one of the individual terms. Summation distributes across addition. Big surprise there. So it distributes across subtraction as well. If you have a constant times a function, there, you can pull the constant out and multiply it by the sum. And then also, if you add a constant to itself n times, you end up with n times that constant. So, for example, if I had this, the sum of 5k equals 1 to 3, what I would have is 5 plus 5 plus 5. Well, isn't that the same thing as 5 times 3? Yeah, okay. All right, some special sums. If you add k to itself, like that 1 to 28 we did, there's a formula that says it's equal to the upper bound times the upper bound plus 1 divided by 2. Stops you from having to do all the arithmetic. So if I added, asked you to add this together, all you had to have done was known that this was equal to 28 times 29 and divide the whole thing by 2. 
n times n plus 1 divided by 2. Yeah, so that's 14 times 29. And I'll let you check it if you want. I don't want to. All right. If you add the first n squares together, you get n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6. Like I said, this becomes extremely important in Cal 2. In Cal 1, we're just kind of using this to drive the summation or the limit definition of an integral, which is what we're getting to and which is what I gave away at the end of the previous section. So in example 3, we're asked to evaluate this sum. Well, first of all, I know that I can distribute this k across here, and that's going to give me the sum k equals 1 to 5 of 7k squared plus 3k, right? And based on the rules that we just saw, we saw that the sums distribute across addition. Furthermore, these constants can come out. This is going to be 7 times the sum k equals 1 to 5 of k squared plus 3 times the sum k equals 1 to 5 of k. So this was 7 times, and if you look back at the formula for the first square, it's n times n plus 1. So that's going to be 5 times 5 plus 1, which is 6. Plus, or times 2 times 5, which is 10. Plus 1 all over 6. Plus, this is 3 times n, which we said was 5 times n plus 1, which is, I'll write it out, 5 plus 1, divided by, was it 2? Yeah. I'm using this formula right here for the sum of k, and this one right here for the sum of k squared, because that's what I have right here, the sum of k squared and the sum of k. And then we just take care of the arithmetic, and I don't have to count everything out. So this is 7 times 5 times 6 times 11 all over 6. This is 3 times 5 times 6 all over 2. Well, those are going to cancel right here, the 6s, and that's going to give me 35 times 11 is 385. Um, 3 times 3 is, these are just going to cancel, leaving behind the 3, so that's 45. And 385 plus 45 is, thank you. So when it says the first n squared, it simply means the first time you go through n. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, is that all 5.1 or is that 5.2 right This is 5.2. Now, all of this is leading up to being able to find the area under a curve. And that brings us to Riemann sums, which I'm going to mention, but we're not going to do anything with. I will not make you find Riemann sums by hand. That's just cruel and unusual punishment because integration is so much easier. The first thing I want you to notice is, unlike the rectangles we used before, the widths of these rectangles are all different. These are called partials. And if we look at the limit as the number of rectangles goes to infinity or the partials goes to infinity of all of these sums here <clears throat> that have various widths and heights, C sub n, F of C sub n, that's a product, then we're going to end up with the integral that goes from a to b of f of x. It ends up giving you the area under the curve. Now, this is true as long as we're trapped between the positive x-axis. If your function is above the x-axis, this area is positive. 
if the graph is between the x-axis and your function is negative, this area is actually going to be the absolute value because this area below the x-axis is negative. Right? That area is negative. Think about it. If this went from 1 to 2, the distance here would be 1, and this function value, the height, would be negative 4, so the area would be negative 4 because the, the function evaluated at that point is negative. So that's an important thing to note. Anytime your curve falls below the x-axis, the area ends up being negative, so if I want the whole area, I have to break this function up at its x-intercepts. And that kind of is leading to the next section as well. So this wraps up five points.